are very narrow-minded. And if you so much as stray off the reservation and start thinking alternative thoughts, well, you will be attacked, you will be maligned, you will be ridiculed, you will be shamed. You're a captive in a prison. The world's philosophy and way of thinking is very, uh, it's, 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 it's captivity. You can't be a free thinker in the world because you deviate just a little bit from what the world says is true, then you are in a whole lot of trouble. You're in a whole lot of trouble. That is the great deception. All you've got to say is one little thing and you're deplatformed, right? You're deplatformed. You've lost your job. You've lost your career because you said one little thing that deviated from the world, especially right now. Everything is just so crazy right now. People are so paranoid. Powerful organizations like Disney are cowering in fear to the woke culture of the world. How many of you have been to Disneyland? And they say, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dreamers, dreamers of all ages, welcome to the happiest place on earth. Sound familiar? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dreamers of all ages, welcome to the happiest place on earth. Isn't that beautiful? Well, now they can't say that. They took off. They can't say ladies and gentlemen anymore. Because of all this gender nonsense. They can't say boys and girls anymore. Because it's offensive. So no longer is it ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dreamers of all kind, dreamers of all ages. They took off. Now, what kind of lunacy is going on? What kind of insanity has captivated our culture to where we can't even say ladies and gentlemen because it's a, it is a, it's counterculture because of all the gender bending and twisting that's going on. You can't use pronouns. I don't know what they're going to do in school, Mondo, when they say, okay, boys line up on this side, girls on this side. You can't do that anymore. Because what if there's somebody in between? So Disneyland, it's no longer ladies and gentlemen. No longer boys and girls. I mean, don't they think that that might offend the people that really go there, which is families? It's crazy. It's crazy. Now somebody, some popular preacher once said something, kind of, said something very surprising recently. He said, uh, <coughs> I was once a man trapped in a woman's body. I said, wow. John MacArthur said that. I was once a man trapped in a woman's body. Then I was born. Then I was born. You guys get it? You know, you're inside of a woman's body. <clears throat> so th this is worldly philosophy. Don't buy into it because you will be a prisoner. You will not be able to say boys and girls anymore. Now we can say that because we're free people because Christians are free thinkers. We are free thinkers. We're not narrow-minded. We're not anti-scientific. We are scientific. All the great scientists, the true scientists of the past, were Christians. Or well, they had a biblical background. Christians are broad thinkers. We filter everything through the Word of God, but we're not anti-intellectuals. <clears throat> and we resist all this madness that's going on. There are boys, there are girls, there's nothing in between. 
We are, we're going to produce a whole generation of confused kids. We're not doing them any favors. We're not doing them any favors. So, see to it that no one takes you captive. Don't allow this to captivate you. Call it for what it is. Lunacy through philosophy and empty deception. That's another descriptive term for the world's, for the world view of the world. It's empty deception. Deception. Deceiving you into thinking you have the answers to the big questions of life and you can you can get the answers through yourself you don't need God the big questions of life human philosophy teaches you have it within yourself to come to the conclusions and to come to the answers to the big questions of life here's a few big questions why are you here? Why are you here? Where are you going when you die? Or where, where are you going? It's a big question. What happens after death? That's a big metaphysical question. Where did we come from? Is there a God? And if so, what is he like? He. Sorry. What is... Some people say, well, you can't use she. You can't use he. How are you going to translate the Bible? The Bible's full of masculine pronouns. Is there a God and what is he like? Well... Worldly philosophy is empty deception deceiving you into thinking that you can answer these questions on your own apart from revelation. Revelation. In other words, God revealing himself to us. That's what the word of God is. It's divine revelation. It's God revealing himself to us, helping us to answer the big questions of life that if left to ourselves could never be answered. <clears throat> so don't be taken captive through philosophy, worldly philosophy, man-centered philosophy. It's empty deception. One of the most famous philosophers that people love to quote and read about is Nietzsche. Nietzsche. That was Phil Jackson's favorite philosopher. He always quoted Nietzsche. I believe he was French. He was a nihilist. He was an atheist. He had a lot of problems. He eventually killed himself, but he became a famous philosopher. He was the inspiration behind Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party. The idea of the super race, the superman, Nazism, that came from Nietzsche. The will to power, that's Nietzsche. See, so these, these philosophies, they're not harmless. They inspire somebody like Adolf Hitler and he takes it, takes and runs with it. They are empty deception. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. And then it goes on. According, we're in, verse, we're in Colossians 2 verse 8. According to the tradition of men. A lot of philosophy slash religion. Because religion can be a philosophy as well. A lot of philosophy slash religion comes to us through the traditions of men. 
It's passed down to us from our parents who got it from their parents and on down the line. One generation passing it on to the next. The tradition of men. And a lot of people will hold to say a, a, a religion. <coughs> even, they know, even though they know that it's inconsistent and it's probably false, they'll hang on to it because it's a tradition of their family. They'll do the sign of the cross. You say, well, what does that mean to you? I don't know. I, I just was, I was raised with it. I was raised with it. They don't know what it means. Uh, no, I was raised a Roman Catholic nominally. We didn't go to church much. I think it means in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I think that's what it means. But wh why do you cross yourself? I have no idea. People do it all the time. Because of tradition. They cannot... Uh, a lot of this tradition is captivating. We look at that word. They can't break out of their re false religion because they're captives because of the tradition of men. Because if they broke out, for instance, if they left the Roman Catholic Church and came to a Bible church, they would take a lot of grief from their brothers and sisters and parents and grandparents they take a lot of grief and a lot of heat and maybe even be expelled from the family. The traditions of men. Man-made traditions, philosophical or religious, are traps. Are traps to keep you ensnared. And then it goes on, according to the elementary principles of the world. Elementary, kindergarten. These philosophies sound so heady, so sophisticated. But in reality, they're simplistic. They're rudimentary. They're basic. They're elementary. They're pretending to be something they're not. They're pretending to be grad school when they're really elementary. <clears throat> Let's look at a couple verses here. Romans 1. Romans 1. Don't lose your spot in Colossians. Romans chapter 1 verse 19. One nineteen, Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. That's the elementary principles of the world espoused by worldly philosophies and religion. Followed by fools. God has made himself known. All you have to do is open your eyes. And you know there's a creative God. Yet. You persist. In denying the existence of God. So you create an alternative religion. The high priest. Charles Darwin. The religion, evolution. And it's rudimentary, elementary, foolish, basic, stupid. 
It really is. To believe that all the complexity in the world is the result of some cosmic big bang. Somebody banged your head somewhere. You believe that? Do you believe all this order, all this, all, all, all this uh, uh, design was all the result of the Big Bang? Do you really believe that all the species that we know today evolved from one single celled organism in the oceans? If it was true, you would see some, you would see missing links. You would see the result of this process somewhere in the world. If we really did evolve from monkeys, there, there's got to be a half human, half monkey somewhere. There's got to be a half man, half ape somewhere in the world. If evolution is how it all started, why did the process stop? Why is there no links between species? You've got fish, you've got birds, you've got amphibians, you've got rodents, you've got small mammals, you've got marsupials, you've got apes, and you've got monkeys, and you've got human beings. And none of those species can breed because they're separate and distinct. Because they were all made uniquely. They didn't evolve into one another. And to believe that is the height of folly. Yet it's taught as science. Oh, pretending to be wise, you're really foolish. You're really foolish. That's what it means in Colossians. This is all elementary principles of the world. <clears throat> this false religion, masquerading as science, bowing down to the high priest, Charles Darwin, and his cousin in the world of psychology, Sigmund Freud. People bow down to Freud the father of psychoanalysis who was a cocaine addict and probably an abuser of women and young women yet people bow down to Sigmund Freud this great trailblazing of the new religion The Bible is true. All this stuff is, see to it that no one takes you captive. Don't become a captive. Don't become a prisoner. Stay free. Use your God-given intellect through philosophy. Don't let anybody take you captive through philosophy, empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world rather than according to Christ. So strongly, strongly reject worldly teaching. It's all a bunch of hogwash, most of it. Right. Every now and then they'll stumble across maybe a biblical truth and okay, they stumbled across that. <coughs> reject it. Otherwise, you become a prisoner. You become a prisoner, a narrow minded, fearful prisoner. You can't get off the reservation because they'll shame you, they'll fire you, they'll, they'll ban you. They'll ban you. So reject that and embrace Christ. Look at it right here. Rather than the, the end of verse 8. <clears throat> Rather than according to Christ. For in Him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Now as you embrace Christianity... You've got to overcome some stumbling blocks. 
Stumbling block number one, in other words, things that are hard to understand. Stumbling block number one is the incarnation. That's what it's, That's why Paul says, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. The reason why the incarnation, God becoming a man, is so difficult for people to to fathom because most of us have the remnants of Greek philosophy running through our minds. The Greeks, the Romans, they had a hard time with Christianity because they accepted the fact that men are all messed up and sinful. How can God, eternal God, become man and why would eternal God become a man so because they couldn't fathom that they rejected Christianity now that's a hard concept to accept I admit it would be like you want you know you, you this ant colony in your yard you know, instead of spraying them with rage like we do sometimes, you love them. You love them. And you want to communicate your love toward them and you want to warn them about impending judgment so you become one of them. I mean, it's a crude illustration. You become, would you do that? Would you, as a high functioning, human being descend to the level of an ant and become one to love and to warn them say now I wouldn't do that <clears throat> that's why you're, you're not God God is so amazing God is so outside of our comprehension that he did that that's why it says right there all the fullness of deity dwelt in the man, Christ Jesus. That's Christianity. It's not easy to wrap your head around, but it's the truth. It's an amazing truth. So you've got to overcome the stumbling block of the incarnation. Yes, God became a man. We know him today as Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God. He became a man to be our substitute, to die in our place. An angel could not die for you because an angel is not an appropriate substitute. An appropriate substitute for you is another human being, and that's what Jesus Christ was, but he was also God. You've got to embrace these great truths. And let your mind think on them sometimes. So, you overcome the stumbling block of the incarnation. And then you challenge, challenge the assumption that sometimes you think about that Christ is not enough for you. You need something more. Christ is not enough. You need a professional therapist. You need to go to Barnes and Noble and get all the self-help books you can find because you're such a mess. Christ is not enough. You need philosophy. You need psychology. You need higher education. You need therapy. You need a personal trainer. You need, uh, what else do you need? <coughs> you need a lot of stuff. You need music therapy. You need special diet. You, got, you, need, you need a new husband. You need a new wife. You need some new kids. You need a new church. You need a lot of new things. You have a lot of needs. People are very high maintenance today. High maintenance. Very high maintenance. What does it say right here? Verse 10. And in him you have been made complete. He's all you need. You've been made complete. 
challenge the assumption that Christ is not enough because Christ is everything. He is sufficient for you. You have problems? Go to Christ. You need comfort? Go to Christ. You need direction? Go to Christ. You need courage? Go to Christ. He's all you need. You don't need anything else. You don't need anything else. <coughs> You've been made complete. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Chapter 1, verse 3. Seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. You've got everything you need. You have all the resources. His divine power has granted to you everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us. The all-sufficiency of Christ. Now, go back to Colossians. We're saying right now that you've got to embrace strongly the teaching of Christ. That you've got to overcome the stumbling block of the incarnation. You've got to challenge the assumption that Christ is not enough. Thirdly, you've got to reject the position that Christ is just an exalted spirit being like angels. Verse 10. Colossians 2 verse 10. In Him you've been made complete, and He is the head over all rule and authority. So you say, well, what is rule and authority? What is what rule and authority? Well, look at verse 15. Let's look at some verses regarding rule and authority, what that is. Verse 15, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumph over them through him. So, he's talking about demons, the demonic world, and he's calling them rulers and authority. Rulers and authorities. Now, we see that also in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 21. Once again, we see those words reappear. Ephesians 1, 21. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And every name that is named. So Christ was raised far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. Chapter 3 of Ephesians, verse 10. Chapter 3, verse 10. So that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Now these could be good angels or bad angels, but in other words, what the church does, the rulers and authorities see. And it's a testimony to them. Finally, chapter 6 of Ephesians, <coughs> verse 12. 6.12 For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against, here they are again, the rulers against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. What are those? Demons. So, it appears that rule or rulers and authority 
are a reference to maybe the whole angelic realm. Good angels, bad angels, or demons. So when you go to Colossians and it says that Christ is the head over all rule and authority, Christ is not simply an exalted angel. Like some, a lot of religions believe that. He is the head over the whole angelic realm. Good angels and bad angels. Christ is not one of them. He is way above them. He's way above them. Now this is important because people always want to gravitate to the worship of angels. The worship of angels is very popular. And people, they would rather worship angels than worship Christ. But Christ is the head over the angelic realm. So, in embracing strongly the teachings of Christ, you overcome the stumbling block of the incarnation. You challenge the assumption that Christ is not enough. You reject the position that Christ is just one of the angels. And then <coughs> you revel in the supernatural work going on in your life. Look at verse 11. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Christ spiritually circumcises you. He removes the body of flesh which signifies the power of the sin nature. We looked at this last week. You were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So, he did something supernatural to you. He did something spiritual to you. He spiritually circumcised you. He removed the body of flesh. Which I think is a reference to the power of sin. The power of sin. He removed. He removed the penalty of sin. Verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism. In other words, baptism, when you're put under the water of baptism, symbolizes death. You died. You died in Christ. You died with Christ. When Christ died, you died. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which also you were raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, canceling out the certificate of debt. <coughs> These are hard things to understand. But what I want you to get is that a lot of supernatural things have happened to you. The end of verse 13, he made you alive. You were dead in your sins, but now you're alive. You're regenerated. You've got a new heart. You've got a new nature. A lot of supernatural things have happened to you. You were circumcised spiritually. You died with Christ. You raised with Christ. That's why the law no longer bears the pen you no longer bear the penalty for breaking God's law because you die when Christ died he died he bore the penalty of God's broken law you died with him and we last week we looked at you know if you commit a crime the moment you die <coughs> you cannot be held guilty anymore because you died. You, you were put to death. 
It was a capital crime. You were put to death. You got the death penalty. Once you die for breaking the law, you are free from that law because you bore the penalty. Now, in Christ, we're in Christ. So, and then finally this, rejoice, we are free from the law's penalty. Verse 14, the law's penalty. What makes you a sinner? You're a lawbreaker. What laws have you broken? God's law. That's what makes us sinners. And because we're sinners, there's a penalty. The soul that sins must die. So there's the penalty for sin, there's the power of sin, and there's the presence of sin. But look at verse 14. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. All the debt that you owed for breaking God's law. He took care of all that and he nailed it to the cross. So now you rejoice because you're free from the penalty of God's law because of what Jesus Christ did for you. So basically, this evening we've looked at the need. Well, we've, we've given you a choice. You can either sign up and embrace the philosophies of this world. But that's a bad move. Because you'll be a captive. You'll be deceived. You'll be ensnared to the traditions of men and so forth. Instead of doing that, reject it. Reject it. It's all hogwash. Strongly embrace the teachings of Christ. To do so, you've got to overcome the stumbling block of the incarnation. You've got to challenge the assumption that Christ is not enough for you. You've got to reject the position that Christ is just one of many angelic beings. You've got to rejoice and, and embrace the supernatural work going on in you. He saved you from the penalty of sin. The power of sin. The presence of sin. He's regenerated you. Made you a new creature. All these great things. In Christ. Let us bow in a word of prayer. We'll invite a rusher forward. <coughs> Pray for this evening's offering. Heavenly Father, help us to never substitute your word for the chicken feed of this world that masquerades as something special when it's not. It's deceptive. It's empty. It's man-centered. Elementary. Help us to be broad-thinking Christian people we are not narrow. We are broad because we're free in Christ. We are not anti-intellectuals. We are the real intellectuals. We believe in science, not politics masquerading as science. We can see through that because we have the mind of Christ and we are free people. So, Father, help us to stay free, help us to stay in your word, to become deep students of Scripture, so that we will be able to help the next generation that's coming up that's going to be so confused. 
so confused. Am I a boy? Am I a girl? What am I? Help us to say you are a boy or you are a girl. That's what God made you. Help us not to slip slide and compromise. Like so many companies and people and churches are compromising today. Father, we thank you. We pray you would bless tonight's offering in Jesus' name. Amen.